Hello, I'm Sarah McDonald, and today I'm talking to Dr. Jay Geed, who's been an international guest of UNSW's Brain Sciences Symposium. He spent more than 20 years studying the adolescent brain development and is the Chief of Brain Imaging at the US National Institute of Mental Health. Hello and welcome to Australia. Thank you. So take us inside the adolescent brain. What has the, the brain imaging told you about changes to the brain during, in, during puberty? The most important thing I could convey is that it's not broken. Um, in terms of most of the media, and, and it's fun to make jokes about the, the, the teen brain, but it's different than the brain of a child, and it's different than the brain of an adult, but it's not defective. It's been exquisitely forged by evolution to um, have features that make it very good for, for our species. So what are those features that have been forged by evolution? Is it things like risk-taking that we do it worry is, about? Yeah, there's three main ones, and one is risk-taking. The other is sensation-seeking, which sounds similar, and it is similar but, but not the same. And the third is a move away from parents toward peers. And these three are not only for humans, but for all social mammals. So I think they're very really deeply rooted in, the, in our biology, and they worked. Um, they allowed us to leave home, which is a, a kind of a, a big decision. You leave somebody who's feeding you and taking care of you. You have your needs met, and you have to venture out on your own. And this helped us to avoid inbreeding. We could travel a bit uh, farther than our, our natal family. And as, as things worked out, um, that turned out to be a good thing in terms of mixing up the, the DNA better. And I suppose we needed the experimentation to make use of our environment as we were moving away from the parental learning and, and, and teaching and, and use of that environment. Right. But we, did, we do wait longer than any other species. Um, uh, it's quite, quite striking in terms of humans uh, um, we, in, into the second decade of life. Um, we're still quite dependent upon our, our parents or caregivers. Um, many other animals, in, uh, giraffes or horses, that after they're born a couple days later, they're, they're running, you know, running about on their own. So humans, we have a very long period of time when, when we need our parents. And so our brain's under construction for longer? Yes, it, it, it's a trade-off. I mean, it, it's a big price to pay, but we don't have to lock and load. We don't have to finish specializing our brains until we get a good sense of what the world around us is like. Human, we can live on the North Pole, we can live on the equator, everywhere in between. We can even live in outer space you know, for a while with the technologies our brains have developed. So the key to making it in all these different environments is to have a brain that's, on the one hand, still under construction, um, but on the other, it still is incredibly adaptable way longer than, than any other species. Now you said it's, uh, it's primed for moving home, but I don't know about in the US, but in Australia kids aren't leaving home. They're staying yes. till their 30s, so. Um, correct. Um, and this is quite noticeable even from the 1970s. Um, um, so the average age for being a grown-up now is about 27 and a half. And this is when people are getting married, when they get the house they're going to live in for a long time, when they get the job that, that's more of a career um, than a job. So about a seven-year difference in, in not very uh, um, uh, many decades. What about, uh, particularly at the moment, um, the adolescent brain is very much going through a different period than, than the generations before. It's absorbing a lot of social media and it's doing a lot of things at once. So teenagers will be doing their homework, they'll be listening to music, they'll be, have their Facebook open and perhaps Twitter and playing online games all at the same time. So how is the adolescent brain coping with this multi-skilling? Yeah, the, 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 the fundamental virtue of, of the adolescent brain is this ability to change and adapt to the environment. But now it's really being uh, challenged in just 15, 20 years, just a gusher of information from the internet, from mobile devices. It's, it's unprecedented. We have access to the greatest minds on our planet, you know, click away. Any fact or figure is accessible in, in a matter of, of seconds. And so it's really changed a lot. The challenge now is how to sort through this gusher of information. How do we know what's true and what's false? How do we use it? How do we find patterns? How do we look for trends and predict? So this is the challenge for the next generation. But the education system it doesn't uh, often move that quickly in terms of how do we teach the brain and teach the skills that are going to be needed um, for the future. Because mm -hmm. not too long ago, if you'd 
be great to memorize all, if you were a businessman all the stock prices or all, all, of, all of the numbers for the companies and that's not a very useful skill anymore. Anybody with an iPhone can, can, can do that um, very easily and quickly. The, the skill will be to try to understand what it all means, how to be creative and how to use this data. And so parents and the teens themselves and, and teachers need to um, adapt to this new reality. Mm -hmm. um, and are the parents who are banning their children from these technologies doing them a service or a disservice? It's almost always well met, I think, in terms of particularly um, sort of focus on reading versus um, you know on online work. But I, I do worry in terms of that that in um, the modern society that that they'll have li um, limitations in terms of if you're not technically literate um, that it. it limits your choices. You, there's many um, jobs and lives you could pursue you know, without, without doing this. But, but even the reading part is interesting that people are afraid that the new technologies aren't natural. They're not sort of what we should be. Reading is not natural at all. <laughs> reading is only about 5,000 years old. Um, so most humans, reading didn't even exist for, for almost all of our, our human history. So. Um, you know, reading's not natural either. It's just that our brains have been able to um, pick it up in the last uh, you know, 5,000 years. Um, but that's sort of, I think, part of that, the same story of how adaptable um, the, the teenage brain is. That's possibly why they're such great at early adapters and, and being digital natives. It is. So digital natives are, are people who have grown up with these technologies. And much like when we learn a language, if we grow up with that language, a, it's a different circuitry in the brain that we learn, it's, that it's sort of more automatic. And one of the trade-offs is that as our brains grow from a baby to child to a teenager to adult and as we get older, it becomes more specialized. It actually doesn't get bigger and bigger, it becomes more and more specialized. And so that's the trade-off we have, but for the teenagers are the sweet spot because they're mature enough to master these technologies, often far better than their parents or even their teachers. Definitely. But they're young enough to be able to embrace uh, the novelty and, and the change. They're not only not afraid of it, they, they're drawn toward it. But this kind of sweet spot of adolescence is what we're really intrigued by in terms of the way that they learn, um, phenomenal you know, changes, the way that they play, the video games, and even we in connect very physically active <laughs> video games mm -hmm. and also the way that we interact with each other. It's, it's been just a huge change. And all of those three often go together. They're don't going they? together. Because they're yes. multi-skilling and they're doing all those three things at once. So are they losing that specialization because they're so able to multi-skill? Right, that's, a, that's a, a key question in terms of especially the, the, the games. It's a multi, multi-billion dollar industry the games that are doing well are really good at captivating our attention. The brain's reward systems way better than homework or you know other, other other types of things. And so, how do we go with it? How do we harness this uh, ability to really grab our attention and to to engage us, not just for the games, but for learning um, and for creating a better world? The the social part is the particularly um, what you said in terms of what are we losing out on because. Really, our, our brains were, are built to be social. That's the, the main task of, of the adolescence, is to find a mate, to reproduce, to stay alive. And a big part of the staying alive is working with the group, having the protection of the group. That's why friends are just so important at that stage in your life. Yes, and yeah. many, much of the brain is dedicated to reading others' emotions and, and real subtle things with eye contact and even smells and touches. and. Particularly those senses aren't uh, available yet anyway in terms of in Facebook and um, even with video you, you miss out on some of the nuances. And so you can have a thousand Facebook friends now which would be very hard to do without technologies. But it's not giving the brain what it was designed for in the sense of the actual human, uh, human contact. Are their brains, is the early research showing you that their brains are adapting and changing in a different way if they have te this technology than other I'm, I'm tempted to say yes, but you know, we ha that's what we're trying to investigate, and so we haven't you know, published um, the solid findings yet, but that's what, we, that's what we're really wondering about in terms of um, the danger uh, is that it's too shallow. It's all very immediate, that it's a mile wide and, and it's deep, and, 
But it doesn't have to, to be that way. You can actually investigate quite deeply on Google and looking at Wikipedia, and, and these, there's a lot of information there. But we want to understand whether people can multitask. Of course, you can walk and chew gum, you can do two things at once, but can you listen to a physics lecture while you're doing English literature homework, or these kind of multitasking? So, un, un, unresolved, um, but most people think no, that the best we can do is rapidly switch from one to another. And every switch we pay a price. There's a, a toll or a multitasking tax. And what about things like... Um risk-taking and mental health in terms of all this technology and, and it's flooding the brain and they're multitasking a lot more. Do you think it has implications for the mental health of, of teenagers? This is an absolutely key, you know, key question because the technologies are really good at engaging our reward systems. Um, and that's why they sell. That's why we can't stand in line at a bank for more than 30 seconds without pulling out the iPhone and you know, playing a, a game. Or, so they, they really kind of have this this trickle of dopamine uh, reward um, that is very, um, I wouldn't say addicting, but it's, it's very um, brain friendly for us to be doing it. I was thinking addicting when you were saying it. Yeah, <laughs> it does to, become a bit addictive. To, to yeah. be doing these, um, you know, these, these kind of tasks um, all the time. And so we need to then you know, understand you know, how to um, use this in the best ways because it is so engaging, um, but what do we want it to be engaged in? And so the obvious, um, from the evolutionary standpoint, is sex and violence. They not only sell, they are important evolutionary-wise. We need to reproduce, and maybe not violence per se, but we need to stay alive. We need to, at times, be aggressive. So these are some of the most powerful things that teens have to deal with. The amount of violent video uh, game usage is up fourfold. Uh, uh, um, since 2002, the games are about as violent as our human minds can, uh, you know, come up with things. Um, the sexual content on the internet, the, the, the trick is not to find it. Right? It's, yeah, it's, it's, the it's, it's so um, prevalent. So this could be you know, a very uh, warning, uh, danger sign. Ironically, or not ironically, the, the, the data for the last 47 years, so since they've been keeping score, Unwanted teen pregnancies are an all-time low. Um, abortions at an all-time low. Sexually transmitted disease all-time low. Uh, uh, murders, other violent crime among adolescents, all-time low. It's gone exactly the opposite direction. So it's a safe place to play I'm, on the I'm internet. Here's baffled. a benefit. From I, I, it. Well, I, I suppose I, if you can be risky online, then less risky physically, perhaps. I, I've, I've been wondering about this a lot. I was pretty shocked at the. Um, this is 2010 data, so it's it's the most recent, but it's not you know yesterday. But um, and people say, well, they're in their basement. They're not on the street mugging people. And, um, but I think it's probably more than that. They're sort of working through these very powerful um, issues and emotions in an in a environment that's not you know, hurting other people. That's, um, uh, I, I have to tell you as a parent, I'm totally confused about, you know, sort of, uh, I'm sure we so all don't, you know, don't want to yeah. promote um, uh, violent video games. But, that could be yeah. a positive side of it. Well, you'll have to come back yeah. and tell us more about the research when it's finished because I'm yeah. sure that's one area that you'll be very keen to follow up. Thanks so much for being our guest today. I'd love to be back. Thanks.